Welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm very excited about this event. We have nearly 500 people registered. So thanks for your patience as we kind of let them all come in through those virtual doors and get connected to our audio. My name is Christine Muir. I'm the community librarian at Cary Library. Tonight's program is made possible through a partnership with the Library Foundation and Lexington Living Landscapes. I am recording this program and later tonight or tomorrow, you all will get a link to the recording, which will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. You can share that link with anyone you think would be interested in watching it. And we do leave those up indefinitely. So there's no time rush um, to, to catch this. When I send you that recording link, I will also send you a, a feedback survey. So you can let us know not only what you think of tonight's program, but also what other kinds of programs you'd like to see the library offer. So we would appreciate your input through that. There will be time for questions and answers at the end. We do have a hard stop around 845 more or less. So we may not get to every question, but we'll do our best. If you have a question for Doug, if you could put that in the Q and A and not in the chat, that gives us a better way of keeping track of everything. As the host, I can't copy and paste your question from chat to Q&A, so I may write back to you and ask you to do that yourself. Um, I apologize, I can't do it for you. If you have questions for me about the program or the technology, that's the place to use chat, and I will be watching that throughout the program. And with that, I am going to start sharing my screen, and um, I'd like to thank both Georgia Harris and Sarah Bothwell Allen for being here from Lexington Living Landscapes. Sarah will tell you a little bit about that organization and then introduce our main speaker tonight, Doug Tallamy. And Doug, I want to thank you as well for being here. So here comes the... Uh, nope. Hold on, it didn't keep that open for me. Give me one second, please. Doo -doo. I have to find that slideshow again, I'm sorry. Okay, let's see if it will work now. There we go. I'm just going to mute myself. Thanks, Christine. And hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. We are so glad there are so many of you. Um, first, we are grateful to the Cary Library Foundation for co-sponsoring and hosting tonight's event. And we are so excited to have Doug Palamy with us tonight. I'm Sarah Bothwell Allen, a member of the Lexington Living Landscape Steering Committee. In a minute or two, I'll introduce Dr. Tallamy, but I wanna take a couple of minutes first to introduce you to Lexington Living Landscapes, if you don't know about us yet. Um, the next slide, please. So I think, yeah, thank you. Lexington Living Landscapes, oops. <laughs> Um, is something. Lexington Living Landscapes is a townwide initiative that was launched this fall through a partnership of four organizations, the Town Sustainable Lexington Committee, the Lexington Field and Garden Club, the Lexington Global Warming Action Coalition, and Citizens for Lexington Conservation. Our purpose is to promote more environmentally and wildlife friendly landscapes in town. We want to help and encourage people to plant native plants, control invasive species, reduce or eliminate the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides and plant and care for trees. We'll be doing this through programs like this one, through our website and newsletter, through demonstration gardens and plant promotions and in other ways. If you haven't already, um, please visit our website, which is lexingtonlivinglandscapes.org to learn about what we're up to and check out the resources already there. And then check back often because we are planning new content all the time. Next slide, please. If you are inspired by what you learned this evening, we encourage you to read some of Dr. Tallamy's books, which are terrific. Um, and we have also posted on our webpage um, a number of things that you can do as next steps. There will be a link on the banner of our homepage to take you to that. Next slide, please. 
And we'll ask you to join our mailing list by writing to us at lexlivingland at gmail.com. You'll receive our newsletter and occasional other notices and alerts and talk to us. There are nine members of our steering committee and you can talk to any of us about what you hope to learn or do and how we can help. And if you're interested in volunteering, we would love to hear that from you as well. All right, last slide, please. So with that, let's turn to the business at hand. It's my pleasure and honor to introduce our speaker this evening. Doug Palamy is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he has authored more than 100 research publications and taught insect-related courses for 40 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand the many ways insects interact with plants and how these interactions affect the diversity of animal communities. He has written three great books on the subject. The most recent, Nature's Best Hope, released a year ago, is a New York Times bestseller. We will have half an hour for questions at the end. Um, as Christine mentioned, please use the Q&A function for asking the questions and we will get to as many as we can. You will see another member of our steering committee, Georgia Harris, um, in the Q&A portion to put the questions to Dr. Calamy. So thank you, Dr. Calamy, the floor is yours. Thank you. There we go. I'm working on screen sharing here. Looks like it's ready. All right, thanks Sarah very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Got a lot to talk about. I wanna tell you what my, my idea of nature's best hope is, but before I do that, I want to return to what happened, not, not this fall, but a year ago, uh, fall. We had what we, we call a, an oak mast. Members of the Red Oak group got together and decided they would make all their acorns at the same time. Pretty sure this happened in Massachusetts as well. And it's what it looked like in a lot of places. Well, I'm easily entertained. So I took one of those acorns and I just stared at it. And I was rewarded because an insect chewed its way out of that acorn, first it chewed a little hole, forced its head capsule through the hole and then squeezed its body through. Kind of looked like the Pillsbury Doughboy, finally plopped onto the ground. Not a very dangerous time for this, this insect larva because it's really good to eat. A lot of things want to eat it. So it's got to get to safety and it does that by squigging, squiggling and wriggling um, down into the soil. Only takes about 30 seconds, down it goes, where it stretches in all different directions and forms a chamber. And in that chamber, it converts itself to a pupa where it stays for two years. Then it comes out as an acorn weevil. This is what a weevil looks like. It looks like uh, they have a big nose, but that's actually an extension of the head capsule. Where's my pointer down here? And the mouth parts are way down here at the end of that extension. Um, the females take that, that, those mouth parts and chew a hole down into the center of the acorn, turn around, lay an egg into it, and that's how the larva gets to the center of the acorn. You might wonder why they spend two years underground. Why don't they come out the next year? Well, red oak acorns take 18 months to complete their development. So if they came out the next year, there wouldn't be any acorns for them. That of course leaves a hole in the acorn, a true vacuum. And you know, nature abhors a vacuum. And in this case, she has filled it with three species of Temnothorax ants, tiny little ants that like to, to live. Their entire colony lives in the vacated holes made by acorn weevils and acorns. And if they find a brand new hole, they get excited because their old house is falling apart. So they tell everybody, and then they work hard to move the colony into this new house. Um, it doesn't take long, about 30 minutes, they move the entire colony and then they post a guard at the entrance and make sure nobody else comes in and they will live there for the next two years until this acorn falls apart. Well, about this time, my wife asked me, what's your point? What are you trying to tell us? I'm trying to tell you that is just one of literally millions of very specialized interactions that comprise most of, of nature. This is another one, the relationship between jays and oaks, actually all over the world, wherever there are jays and oaks, jays are the primary dispersers of oak acorns. And of course, jays spend the winter eating those, those acorns, a good mutualistic interaction. Uh, found out this fall, what is pollinating witch hazel? I don't know if you've ever wondered about that. Witch hazel, of course, blooms late. It blooms a, you know, after frost, well into the fall. And you can read, I always wonder what was pollinating witch hazel? It says, well, small flies and fungus gnats. I look on the flowers, I never see any flies or fungus gnats. It turns out it's, it's actually probably a group of moths that we call winter moths, like the bicolored sallow. Uh, they fly very late as well. I caught bicolored sallows on Christmas Eve this year. 
Um, so uh, they're the primary pollinators, and I don't know whether witch hazel is blooming late to take advantage of winter moths or whether winter moths are flying late to take advantage of, of witch hazel, but at this point they take advantage of each other. You won't have pileated woodpeckers uh, anywhere near you, breeding at least, unless you have a good supply of carpenter ants, because that is what they feed their young. It's the only thing they feed their young. And of course, you're not going to have carpenter ants unless you have the big trees that make those carpenter ants. You're not going to have this bee, Andrena faciliae, unless you have this plant, facilia, because that is the only pollen that that particular bee species can rear its young on. As a matter of fact, pollen specialization is very common in our native bees. We've got about 4,000 species of native bees and over a third of them can only reproduce on the pollen of a single plant genus. So for example, in, in New England, there are at least 13 species of bees that can only reproduce on the pollen of perennial sunflowers. You won't have Baltimore checker spots unless you have white turtle head and on and on and on. Nature really is a series of highly specialized relationships. Today though, those relationships Nature itself is on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not take Teddy Roosevelt's advice. Way back in 1908, Teddy went to the, well, he heard that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the canyon, he looked out over the edge and he said, leave it as it is. And with those five words, he started the process of creating the Grand Canyon National Park. The problem today, of course, is that leaving most of the country as it was is not an option. We changed it long ago. There's only about 5% of the lower 48 states that's anything close to its original pristine condition. And that's because we have logged the country repeatedly. We've tilled it, we've drained it, we've grazed it. We got 770 million acres of ranged land in the US, which is four and a half times the size of Texas. And we paved it or otherwise developed it. We have straightened our rivers and dammed them, and you can spell that any way you want. We've polluted our skies and changed our climate for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers and we've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from other continents, many of which are running amok in our natural areas like kudzu is doing right here. In short, we've carved up the natural world into tiny remnants of its former self. And each one of those remnants is too small and too isolated from other remnants to sustain the species that run the ecosystems that we all depend on. Why have we done this? Well, we thought that, that uh, planet Earth, our nest, was, was so big we could foul it forever and there wouldn't be any consequences. And when there were just a few of us, that was kind of true, but there are not a few of us anymore. There's so many of us that we were wrong about that. And that's why we're seeing headlines like this. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? Followed by this one, North America has lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. That's a third of the North American bird population gone. Now the UN predicts that we could lose a million species to extinction uh, as soon as the, the next, next 20 years. And I love the way they report this as if it's just another headline. Excuse me, they might as well say we're gonna lose oxygen in the next 20 years and then go on as if it just doesn't matter. This is not an option, folks. This is simply not an option. So I could go on talking about the pox that we humans have delivered upon the environment and that's upon all of our houses, but... It's not what this talk is about. This talk is about a cure for that pox. It's a cure that'll take small efforts from a lot of people, but they will deliver enormous physical, psychological, and environmental benefits to everybody. Let's return to this headline uh, briefly. The insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of life on earth? Well, E.O. Wilson, you know E.O. Wilson from Harvard, uh, you know, probably the most famous biologist uh, still alive today. He told us, what it would mean if we were to lose insects. And he did that way back in 1987 with this paper, The Little Things That Run the World. His message was very clear. Life as we know it depends on insects. And if they were to disappear, so would most of the flowering plants. And if most of the flowering plants went extinct, uh, that would drastically change energy flow through our terrestrial habitats to the point that the, the food webs that support our animals, our amphibians, our reptiles, birds, mammals, even our freshwater fish. Those food webs would collapse and all of those creatures would disappear. The biosphere, the living portion of the earth would rot because we would have lost insect decomposers that uh, rapidly turn over nutrients. We would only have bacteria and fungi left. Uh, and of course, humans would not survive any of those drastic changes. The good news is that doesn't have to happen. We can save our insects, we can save our birds, we can save nature itself, but we're gonna to have to change the way we landscape in order to do that. Why do we have to do that? Remember, humans are, are products of nature. We are totally dependent on natural systems. 
we're dependent on what we call ecosystem services. Um, here are just a few of the things that, that plants produce that we absolutely need. I don't want you to think ecosystem services are just for humans. They're for everything that's out there. How about the production of oxygen? We need that. Everything needs that. <clears throat> Clean water. We all need that. Carbon capture. Very important these days. Plants are pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, out of harm's way, building their tissues out of that carbon, and then they pump the extra carbon into the ground through their root systems. The, our soils are brown or black because of carbon that has been deposited there over the eons from plant roots. They build topsoil and hold it in place. Plants prevent floods. They dampen severe weather and many other things. What do animals do for plants? Well, they provide pest control services. They pollinate nearly 90% of our flowering plants. They disperse plant seeds and other things. So when we, when we create landscapes like this that destroy the production of ecosystem services, it's a serious problem. This never was a good option, but today with 7.8, 7.9 billion people on the planet, we need more ecosystem services now than ever before. So this, this type of landscaping simply is no longer an option. There have been visionaries through the ages who recognized that we humans needed to work on our relationship with, with the planet that supports us. And Aldo Leopo was one of the most eloquent, wrote extensively at the beginning of the 1900s. <clears throat> One of the things he said was the oldest task in human history is to live in a piece of land without spoiling it. Now there have been some indigenous groups that have been good at doing that, but, but our huge Western societies and huge Asian societies have been terrible at doing that. We typically uh, take far more from the earth than it has to offer uh, in one spot and completely destroy it and then move to another spot and destroy that. And Aldo clearly saw that uh, that was not a sustainable way to go about business. So he had a dream that we humans could actually develop what he called a land ethic. <clears throat> he recognizes that we that we had to use, you know, we had to use uh, Earth's bounty. We had to farm it and lumber and graze and mine and hunt and do all of those things. But he dreamt that we would learn how to do those things gently. We would we would use the Earth without destroying local ecosystems, and that's what he called the land ethic. And he wrote about it in the Sand County Almanac. What he didn't talk about, uh, and I'm not sure why, was developing a land ethic where we actually lived. Uh, and again, I'm not sure why that was, but I suspect that the notion that humans and nature cannot coexist in the same place at the same time, that notion was so deeply embedded in, in the culture of Aldo Leopold's day, and it's still embedded in our own culture, that he may not have seen it as an option. Well, what I wanna to argue tonight is that living with nature not only is an option, it's the only viable option that's left to us. Remember, uh, in the past, conservationists were pretty much uh, where people weren't, where there weren't a lot of people. We now need to turn that on its head. We have to save nature, reconstruct nature where there are a lot of people because that's most of the planet. In other words, we have to find ways for nature to thrive, not just exist, but thrive in human dominated landscapes a new goal. Where are we going to start? Well, we can't ignore private property, places like this, because so much of uh, the land is privately owned. 85.6% of the U.S. east of the Mississippi is privately owned. <clears throat> if we only did conservation um, uh, off private property, at best, that'd be 15% of the land, not nearly enough to succeed. But there are lots of places that we don't typically think of as options for conservation that could be. Millions and millions of acres. How about power and pipeline rights of ways? We have 21 million acres in those types of, of land uses. Railroad rights of ways, another 3 million acres. Roadside, 17 million acres. Golf courses, 2 million acres. Airports, three. You know, the Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are big areas. And then we have all the places where we live, both in, in the country, in suburbia, in cities, hundreds of millions of acres in those, those places. So if you just add up that, that's 599 million acres that could be used for conservation that really isn't right now. How big is 599 million acres? Well, it's bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, plus Virginia, New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, plus Montana, plus California, even throw Texas in there. Not having a place to do conservation is not the issue. Um, we, we could do conservation just about anywhere. Now, what we're really talking about is, is going to places where we have already dismantled most of, of functioning ecosystems and put them back together again. Will we be able to reconstruct exactly what was there before we came? No. 
excuse me, but it doesn't mean that we can't re re reunite a number of the organisms that have specialized relationships with each other to the point where we have functioning ecosystems again, even if they're not exactly what was there before humans came. But we have to start with the species that are most important to ecosystem function. Not all species contribute equally. So we have to start with those building blocks. And there's two things that we have to do. We have to sustain the, the plants, all those really critical flowering plants. And what's gonna do that is pollinators. So we can't do it without, without our major pollinators, the bees. And then once we have our plants, we have to take the food that they create. Remember, they're, they're, they're capturing energy from the sun and turning it into food and then pass that food on to other, other organisms. Most vertebrates, for example, don't eat plants directly. They eat something that ate plants. That's something typically is insects. And most of the insects that are eating plants that then deliver the food to other animals are caterpillars. So we need to construct ecosystems with caterpillars because they're transferring more energy from plants to other animals than any other type of plant eater. If we lose our caterpillars, most of the energy is gonna stay locked up in plants. Let's use a, a Carolina chickadee as an example. We've got a lot of data from chickadees. Um, they're the birds, of course, that are at our feeders right now. About 50% of their diet in the winter time is seeds. But when they're reproducing, when they have babies in the nest, their babies can't eat seeds. So they switch to insects exclusively. And if they're in a rich environment, they will feed their young entirely on caterpillars. Uh, and they are not alone. 96% of our terrestrial birds are rearing their young on insects, and most of those insects are caterpillars. How do we know that? Well, there's a number of, of lines of evidence that suggest that. But this is a citizen science project that my, uh, one of my PhD students, Ashley Kennedy, did recently. She put out a call to bird photographers to take pictures of birds while they were bringing food to the nest. And they sent those pictures to Ashley. She got thousands of pictures and identified what was in the beaks of those birds uh, and was able to reconstruct what the nestling diet was for 20 of the common bird families in North America. And that's what you see here. The green bars uh, are the percentage of those diets that were insects. And in 16 out of the 20 uh, bird families, insects or caterpillars, did I say insects? Caterpillars, green bars are caterpillars. In 16 of the 20 bird families, caterpillars are dominating the diet. So imagine again, what would happen if we took caterpillars out of the system? Most of the terrestrial birds would not be able to reproduce. So something special about caterpillars, let's talk about what it is. There's actually several things that are, that are special about caterpillars. And, and one obvious one is that uh, they're pretty soft. They're soft prey items. Think of this guy as if he's a, a little sausage with a very thin wrapper. The thin wrapper is exoskeleton, it's, it's uh, cuticle, it's undigestible, so the birds don't want a lot of that. And because the caterpillars are soft, the, the parents can stuff them down the throat of their babies without fear of, of injuring them. And if you've ever watched a parent bird rear its young, they're, they're pretty rough. Their beak is like a plunger, they just stuff it down there. Caterpillars are also relatively large prey items. One medium-sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. Now, some of our smaller birds do chase aphids around, but you want to chase 200 aphids or get one caterpillar. They're nutritious, very high in fat, very high in protein, um, low percentage of chitin compared to most other types of insects, particularly beetles. Beetles are not like little sausages. They're like little tanks. A lot of undigestible material in a beetle, and they've got a lot of sharp edges. Uh, and also, caterpillars turn out to be the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. Now, I mentioned carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate. Birds are vertebrates, and vertebrates cannot make their own carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids. Uh, yet we have to get carotenoids from plants because they're essential for our, our diet. And that's why my, my wife, Cindy, says I have to eat my, my carrots to get my beta carotene and my tomatoes to get my lycopene, my whatever that is to get my lutein. Uh, and she makes sure I eat all of those things because they stimulate my immune system. And I cannot think of a, a better time to have a very strong immune system. They are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better, she was right. She didn't know she was right, but it turns out she was right. They improve sperm vitality, improve sexual attractiveness. Now we're talking about uh, male birds in particular, like this uh, male prothonotary warbler, who is bright yellow because he's had access to lots of lutines. He takes those lutines and, and makes pigments out of them and puts them in his feathers. 
And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he attracts. Well, where are they getting their carotenoids? They're getting them from the prey items that they capture, but carotenoids are not equally distributed among invertebrate prey. The first two bars here are types of caterpillars. They have far more carotenoids than other types of, of uh, insect prey. Third bar is uh, orthopteroids, things like uh, grasshoppers and katydids and crickets. Here are the adult uh, moths and but or, or caterpillars down here, the moths and butterflies themselves. They have far fewer carotenoids because they're not eating green leaves. It's the caterpillars that eat green leaves. And here's the earthworm way down here. So the early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids when he gets the worm. Does carotenoid level influence prey choice? Well, Ashley did another study that suggests that it does. She put GoPro cameras on the roofs of bluebird houses, and those cameras took a picture once every second. And the object was to catch, uh, get a picture of the bluebirds as they flew into the nest with a prey item in their, in their mouth. Well, she had a lot of bluebird boxes and uh, a lot of GoPro cameras, and she did it for three years, so she got over a million pictures to go through. But out of those pictures, there were 7,628 that were good enough that she could identify the prey item and construct this, this little graph here. Uh, and indeed, the, it turns out caterpillars are brought more often than anything else, and they have the highest level of carotenoids, followed by those orthopteroids, which have the next level, and then everybody else is nestled down here. Um, so all of this suggests that caterpillars may not be optional parts of bird diets. It's looking like they are essential parts of bird diets. So let's just say uh, birds need caterpillars. And the next question is, how many do they need? Is one or two enough? Well, let's return to chickadees uh, and answer that question. Remember, these are just model organisms. It's what chickadees do, most other birds are doing as well. How many caterpillars does it take to make a clutch of chickadee? Well, not one or two. It takes thousands, 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars to make one clutch of chickadee, depending on the number of, of chicks in the nest. Uh, and then after they fledge, this is just to get them to, to the point where they fledge. After they fledge, the parents continue to feed them caterpillars for another 21 days, but they're flying all around so nobody can count those. Uh, so if you want to have chickadees breeding in your yard, and you do want to have chickadees breeding in your yard, because in so much of, of the country, that's all that's left is our yards. You have to have all those caterpillars in your yard. They are only foraging about 50 meters from the nest. They're not flying five miles down the road to the nearest woodlot. And if we landscape in a way that does not provide all those caterpillars, um, that's called insect decline. Uh, and it causes bird decline. Uh, more and more data suggests that the, the terrible drop off in birds that we're seeing is related to the fact that we're losing our insects as well. We went to the original data set that uh, Rosenberg et al published. They were the ones that found we'd lost 3 billion birds in the last 50 years. And we divided those birds, took terrestrial birds, divided them up into two groups. The species that required insects at some point of their life history, usually when they were breeding, and the species that didn't require insects. So things like our finches and doves that can uh, reproduce on seeds, actually. They actually gained a little bit uh, of numbers. But the species that require insects lost on average 10 million individuals per species. So this doesn't prove cause and effect, but it certainly is suggestive that as, as uh, insects decline, so do birds. Which means if we want our birds around or all the other things that, that uh, eat, eat caterpillars, eat insects, we're going to have to landscape in a way that produces these things, which is a totally different way from the way we've landscaped in the past. In the past, we, we thought plants were just decorations. We didn't want anything to eat them. So we made sure there weren't any insects we had dead landscapes. We're going to turn that on its head and we're going to put the plants that actually make insects, make caterpillars into our landscapes. Uh, and, and that's it's not too hard. You just pick the plants that make a lot of, of uh, caterpillars. But there is a catch and that is that most plants don't make a lot of caterpillars. So we have to know which ones are really good at doing that. Well, let's use the, the monarch butterfly as a, as a perfect example. Everybody knows monarchs require so you can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwood, you can have your burning bush and your bush honeysuckle and all those ornamentals from Asia that we love. And you won't have any monarchs because they can't eat any of those plants. The only thing they can develop on are milkweeds. And monarchs are not exceptions. Caterpillars are really fussy about what they can eat. 
In other words, they are host plant specialists. And it turns out that most of the insects that eat plants are very specialized because plants have made them that way. Plants don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they've loaded their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals, secondary metabolic compounds that make those leaves either bitter or downright toxic. And it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world. And that's why it's green in the summertime. It's not because there are no insects out there that, that want to eat those plants. It's because most of the insects that are out there can't eat most of the plants. They're just, they're too well protected. And if you don't believe me, next, next uh, summer, next springtime, go out and eat a plant. See if you like it. You're not going to like it. There's a reason it's hard to get our kids to eat vegetables. They inherently know that they're toxic. That's my little joke. Um, this is not a joke. Insects do eat plants. So how do they do that? How do they get around those, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Each lineage of plant produces a, 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 a unique cocktail of chemical defenses. And insects can't adapt to all of those, those uh, cocktails. So they pick one or two plant lineages and they, get, they develop the adaptations that allow them to circumvent those defenses. They develop enzymes, that allow them to store and excrete and detoxify those compounds, behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that allow them to minimize their exposure to those compounds. But it takes a long period of exposure to, to those plant lineages for all these adaptations to fall into place. It does not happen overnight. And because they can't adapt to all the different types of defenses, they pick one or two lineages and that is what the specialization is all about. That is why our insects are so poor at eating any plant we bring in from another continent because our insects have never seen it before. They don't have the adaptations that allow them to deal with it. What I'm trying to say here is that plant choice matters. If we're trying to reconstruct food webs in areas where we've, we've destroyed them over time, we have to pick the right plants or it's not gonna work. And I'm gonna give you three examples of how well it does work when you do the right plants. I'm gonna start with, with uh, our house right here in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, we we uh, bought a 10 acre parcel of a farm that was broken up a few years ago. It was an old farm, it had been farmed for uh, about 300 years. Soil was exhausted. The last thing they did was, was mow it for hay. Uh, but this area, most areas are, are so heavily invaded with, with um, Asian plants, Oriental bittersweet and Japanese honeysuckle and bush honeysuckle and burning bush and miscanthus and calorie pear and all those guys that when you mow for hay, you're really mowing all these exotics and calling it hay. So when we built the house and they stopped mowing, this is what came back. It was just this giant tangle of, of uh, non-native plants, all 10 acres covered with it. This is my wife, Cindy, and she got rid of it all. So if you have a bad uh, invasion of, of, of non-natives, don't give up. It is a lot of work, but if, if little old Cindy can do it, you can do it too. What was I doing while she was uh, clearing the property? I was telling her she was doing a great job, uh, but I was also putting plants back and I was doing it uh, kind of selfishly. I had this little hobby of taking pictures of caterpillars I've never seen before. Uh, and this was one I, I tried. The object was to track these caterpillars to our property by putting in the appropriate host plant. This is the Canadian owlet. That's what the adult looks like. Well, you don't have Canadian owlets unless you have meadow roux. And we didn't have any meadow roux. Um, the, you know, our meadow roux used to be here hundreds of years ago, I'm sure, but it was long, long gone. So I got some seeds from someplace else, put in some meadow roux, and I didn't know if the Canadian Alice would ever find it. Um, maybe they had to come from Canada, I don't know. But uh, so I planted my meadow roux and I didn't go out and check the plants for about a month and a half. They grew really nicely. And finally I walked by and they were almost defoliated by Canadian Alice. The caterpillars had found it right away. Well, the adult moths have found it right away. So that was a big success. Now we have a good population of meadow roux and a good population of, of uh, Canadian alet. So we've added two species to the, to the property. Same story with the goldenrod stowaway. This is a misnomer. Uh, this beautiful moth has nothing to do with goldenrod. It's a specialist on this plant, Biden's aristosa. I did know where there was some Biden's aristosa in a power line cut about 14 miles away. So I went and got some seeds, planted them. They grew really nicely. Well, it took about a year for the uh, goldenrod stowaway to find my Biden's aristosa, but now I've got a good population of both of those. So I've added four species to the property. One in Hackberry Emperor here because it's a butterfly that should be here. Uh, 
But of course, as its name suggests, it's, it's a specialist on Hackberry and we didn't have any Hackberry. So I planted Hackberry. This took three, four years before the uh, butterflies actually found it. But um, another big success, I walked by one of my Hackberry trees this June and uh, there were nine Hackberry emperor caterpillars on a single branch. So that way that is six species. Um, I did not plant goldenrod, came in on its own and along with it came many of the things that, that are specialists on goldenrod, like the brown hooded owlet, the arcidura flower moth, the goldenrod leaf miner, the distinct sparaginothus, the goldenrod gall moth. Now this is one that hasn't come, the goldenrod flower moth and its beautiful larvae. I don't know why, why not, why they haven't found it. So this is, this is anticipation. This is like waiting for the ketchup to come out of the bottle. Every year I go out, I look for the goldenrod flower moth and one of these years it'll be there and that'll be a great day. Planted Virginia creeper. Yes, Virginia creeper, good fall color, can climb our trees without pulling them down. It is a very productive native plant. It's a wonderful host for uh, some of our best sphinx moths, like the Pandora sphinx and its beautiful adult, the lettered sphinx, the hog sphinx, the abbot sphinx, and many other types of caterpillars depend on Virginia creeper. One of the zebra swallowtail. Now this was this was pushing it because we're at the northern limit of zebra swallowtails. They are pawpaw specialists. We didn't have any pawpaw, so we planted pawpaw. The nearest population of zebra swallowtails that I know about is 26 miles south of us. And again, I didn't you know didn't know if they'd ever ever make it up this far, but uh, we waited nine years, but they finally did. They made it up. Um, and in the meantime, we got the pawpaw sphinx. I didn't know there was a pawpaw sphinx, and lots of pawpaws. Uh, wanted the double tooth prominent just because it's such a cool looking caterpillar, but we needed uh, elms to do that. So I planted American elm, the caterpillar came right away. Wanted the evening primrose moth because it's beautiful and I like beauty like anybody else. So we planted evening primrose. Uh, the moths came, they spend the day with their heads stuffed in the flowers. It's very cute. And we planted lots of oak trees. And these are just examples of the plant lineages we put into our, our yard. But I want to focus on oaks uh, for a few minutes because they're such important plants. This is the Bedford Oak in Bedford, New York. And people argue about whether it's 400 years old or 500 years old. It's enormous. And a lot of people think that your oaks have to be enormous before uh, they can produce or, or be productive in your yard. Excuse me, I'm burping up my, my dinner here. Um, so I hear people say, I'm not going to plant an oak. I won't live long enough to enjoy it. Uh, well, unless you die before the next year, uh, that's not true. You, you can enjoy it because they start being productive right away. And I can say that with confidence because I planted my oaks mostly as acorns uh, or as two foot bare root whips. And right away they start producing the insects that drive the food web in my yard, like the, the uh, solitary oak leaf miner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered moth, orange headed epicolema, the red wash caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted oneida, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak punky, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red, red humped oak worm, the orange humped oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the greater oak dagger moth, the streak dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the crown bucolatrix, the white blotch heterocampa, the oblique heterocampa, the red line panopoda, the laugher, and literally hundreds more species have come to, to our oaks, including the, the Bernie Meme caterpillar. I got this one just the other day. And they come right away. Uh, this is a pin oak that has poked its head above the leaves here. And here's a crocus geometer standing on the ground eating those leaves. So you don't have to wait centuries for your oaks to start to help out your property. They do it immediately. This is a picture of, of uh, our, my house, our house, from the same place I took that original picture. I'm sitting in this window right up here. Um, look, we have lawn, we're very traditional, but I just, just wanna show you, we put plants back uh, into the yard. I'm still adding any plants. I'm sure that I haven't, haven't gotten all the ones that used to be here, but every time I add plants, I get new species of moss. Uh, and this is exciting to me because it's the moths that are driving the food webs in my yard. And I, four years ago, I, I uh, made it a goal to take a picture of every species of moth on our property. Still doing it, but as of this fall, I reached 1,030 species of moths. Now we have 10 acres in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania is 2.4 million acres. So in one 240 thousandth of the land mass, we have 40% uh, of all the moth species that occur in Pennsylvania. 
And because each one of these moss species is a type of bird food, we've recorded 59 species of birds that have bred on our 10 acres, which is 38% of all the species of terrestrial birds that breed in Pennsylvania. I'm telling you this because I want to convince you that it works. All of this life has come back to our property because we put the right plants in. I saw this headline in the fall. World Wildlife Federation uh, says that we've lost two thirds of, of wildlife on planet Earth since 1970. And I'm thinking, not at our house, not at our house. I'm sure we have increased biodiversity at our house by more than two thirds. And it didn't take that long simply because, by putting the plants back. So these terrible headlines are reversible if we act now. But I know what you're thinking. I've got 10 acres. Maybe you don't have 10 acres. Will it work in smaller lots in, in suburbia? That's a good question. So let's go to Margie and Dan Terpster's house in Kirkwood, Missouri. They have 0.6 acres. Um, so that's 18 times less property than Cindy and I have. And they live in the middle of a, a suburban development. Everybody else has big lawns. And the uh, big invasive plant in Kirkwood, Missouri is bush honeysuckle. So the first thing they did was take out the bush honeysuckle. Then they planted a bunch of native plants and they put in a, a water feature that they call a bubbler. And then they sat back and started to count the birds that are using their yard. And they're up to 149 bird species that have used their yard, including 35 warbler species. Just to put that in perspective, uh, we've only recorded eight warbler species at, at our house. So on 0.6 acres, yes, it works there as well. What about urban yards? Will it work in tiny urban yards? Well, let's go to Pam Carlson's house in Chicago. And I mean in Chicago, right over this wall here is uh, one of the runways of O'Hare Airport. Right over here is Kennedy Expressway. Pam has one-tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in North America. Uh, and there's no connectivity between her yard and any other uh, bit of, of, of natural area. She's a tiny little island. Well, she took out her invasive plants, put in 60 species of native plants, a little water feature for the birds, and then she started to count her birds. And she's up to, uh, that's out of date. It's 117 species of birds have used her yard. A great horned owl came the other day, including a woodcock. There's Pam's woodcock. So if you haven't seen Woodcock lately, you can go to Pam's house in Chicago and check it out. What about city centers though? You know, 82% of us live in, in cities. Well, in 2014, I was, I was staring at this plant, Asclepius tuberosa. People call it butterfly weed, which reminds me we have a serious marketing issue with um, how we, we name our native plants. We call them weeds and wonder why people don't plant them. So we're not gonna call this butterfly weed anymore. We're gonna call it Monarch's Delight. All right, I was staring at Monarch's Delight 2014. First thing I saw were two species of leafcutter bee, megachylid bee. Um, I know they're megachylid bees because they've got, they carry their pollen on their tummy and not on their legs. Well, megachylid mega, mega bees have very specific needs. So I was impressed that they were there at all. Um, what are they needs? They need pollen and nectar, but they also need soft leaves, leaves like uh, you find on a red bud, because they cut the edges out of the leaves, leaves these little semicircles, uh, and then they roll the leaves up, stuff them full of pollen, uh, and then stuff the whole package into a, a crack. They lay an egg on that. So here are three packages stuffed into uh, the same crack. This is a picture from, from uh, by Heather Holm. And that's, what, what, uh, that's how megachylid bees reproduce. Well, there was a red bud plant right next to the Monarch's Delight. Um, so the bees had everything they needed. And there were also bumblebees there. Uh, and I think it's because the red bud was there as well. Remember, bumblebees overwinter as queens. There are no workers. So in the spring, the queen has to do all the work herself. And if she doesn't have a lot of early spring forage, like you see on, on uh, red bud, her colony is probably going to fail. Well, there were bumblebees there. So obviously, the red bud helped a lot. And then I saw a monarch. I saw two monarchs foraging on Monarch's Delight. Now this was 2014. Remember 2013 was the low point of the monarch population in the East, only 3.6% of them uh, left compared to 1976. I had gone all of 2013 without seeing a single monarch. And this was June, so it was early in the year to be seeing monarchs up this far North. So I was impressed. I said, well, great. Maybe we're not gonna lose our monarchs after all. Why were they there? Well, they had Monarch's Delight, but they also had, uh, this is purple milkweed was there. They could forage on it and they had a place to reproduce. They had what they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the High Line, the middle of Manhattan. And this is the strip of nature that we're talking about here. 
30 feet. This is a, the Highland, of course, is a, an elevated railroad that has turned into a tourist destination. Millions of people go to the Highline every year, um, but so does some wildlife. This is Rick Dark. He's always wanted me to see, see the Highline. I'm not much of a city boy, so I drag my feet. I figure, well, I'm going to see pretty plants and nothing will be on them. But I was completely wrong. 30 feet above the taxis, the middle of construction, the middle of Manhattan. There are now uh, at least 30 species of bees that use the High Line. There are the monarchs. There are species of birds. There's uh, uh, much more wildlife than I ever thought would be using it in the middle of Manhattan. So I, I was impressed. You know, thoughtful native planties can bring light back to the middle of Manhattan. I think we can do this anywhere. But there are four things we need to think about if we're going to be successful. And the first one is we have to shrink the area that's in lawn. Because we got too much lawn. We got 40, more than 40 million acres of lawn nationwide. So that's the size of New England that's uh, maintained as a deadscape. Uh, why? Well, it's a, you know, it's a status symbol. It tells our neighbors that we are uh, well-to-do, that we are good, good citizens. We know what the culture demands and we're up for it. But we can do all those things and cut the area of lawn in half. We can still manicure our, our status symbol, but we're going to plant the rest of the, of the area. And if we do that, if we cut that area in half, uh, that's 20 million acres to work with for conservation. We can create a new national park. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks, plus Yellowstone, plus Yosemite, Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badlands National Park, Olympic National Park, plus Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus Denali, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. Add up all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. We will have the largest national park in the country. What are the benefits of putting some parts of nature right where you live? Well, you can, you can develop either for the first time or reacquaint yourself with nature. Develop that personal relationship that uh, we all actually need quite a bit. And you can do it at your own time and your own pace. You can avoid crowds. You know, if you go to a real national park, Millions of people there are there with you. It's free. There's no admission fee. It's never closed, no matter what pandemic comes down the road. No travel hassles. But here's the big one. You get to experience the natural world alone. I don't see how you can develop that personal relationship without experiencing it alone. And this is so important for our kids. Remember, our kids are the future stewards of the planet. And if they don't know what they're stewarding, if they don't get to know nature, um, they're going to be lousy stewards. So Richard Lou says they're suffering from uh, nature deficit disorder. What are we going to do? Well, we, we get 30 kids and put them on a bus with a teacher and they drive for an hour and then they walk around a natural area. Teacher tells them not to touch anything. Then they get back in the bus and they go home. And, you know, I'm sure that's better than nothing. But what they've really experienced rather than the natural world is 30 other kids and a teacher telling them not to touch anything. If they have nature at home, they all they have to do is go outside alone, no parental supervision, let them work it out. I guarantee well, most of them will survive. And they might even learn how to, to hunt lizards. I'm learning this from my, uh, my own granddaughter. This is Zoe who lives in Hawaii and her patch of nature isn't all that natural. It's a little piece of lawn about 10 by 10 feet and a hedge, uh, but there are no lizards there. So she sent this picture to me to, to explain how you hunt lizards. You get on the ground and you cover yourself with sticks and leaves uh, so that the lizard doesn't see you coming. And then you crawl very slowly toward the lizard. No, no smiling, this is serious business here. Um, you can wear your best dress, that's okay. But you sneak up on the lizard, you catch the lizard, you put them in an aquarium and you've got that, that, that personal experience, personal interaction with the natural world. Now, I don't think Zoe's going to be, be hunting lizards like this the rest of her life, but I guarantee she will remember hunting lizards like this the rest of her life. If you want to do more than, than hunt lizards, um, get this book, Nature Play at Home by Nancy Stranisti. She uh, talks about dozens of examples of great ways to expose your kids to nature. And if you want to join Homegrown National Park, it's free. You just go to homegrownnationalpark.org. You put in your data. That's where you live and how much area you either have uh, um, converted to, to native landscapes or the area you've protected or the area you're going to convert. Um, and your little piece of the world will, will light up. And the object is, this is a social media adventure here, is to get 
want to get beyond the choir. We want to get everybody excited about getting on the map and then we can watch the US light up. The initial goal is to get all 20 million acres uh, preserved on the map here. But uh, why stop there? We'll just we'll just do the whole whole country. OK, we're going to shrink the lawn. We're going to uh, put in plants on half the area that was in lawn. But what plants are we going to use? Well, um, we need to use keystone plants, at least for, for uh, some of those plants. What is a keystone plant? Remember what a keystone is. In a Roman arch, the keystone is the center stone. And if you take that stone out, the arch collapses. Well, keystone plants are so important in food webs that if you take them out of the food web, the food web collapses. This is one of the most important things we've discovered in my lab in the last several years. And that is that um, there are really just a few native plants that are doing most of the work. About 5% of our native plants are making about 75% of the caterpillar food that drives our food webs. 14% of our native plants are making 90% of the caterpillar food, which means 85% of our native plants aren't contributing all that much. So at the end, the question is no longer just are natives better than non-natives. On average, they certainly are, but I can build a 100% native landscape that produces very little and you won't have a thriving ecosystem there. So what we need to do is make sure we've got those ecologically productive plants in our landscapes uh, and make sure we don't have ecologically destructive plants, those invasive species like, like burning bush that escape our yards and then um, biologically pollute, ecologically castrate all the natural areas around us. I get an email once or twice a, a year from uh, somebody who says, don't I know that, that ginkgos, ginkgo biloba from Asia, actually grew in North America 7 million years ago. That makes them native. That means we can plant them. Well, yes, I did know that ginkgos grew in North America 7 million years ago. We can argue about whether that makes them native today, but I'm not going to bother because this is not the, the metric anymore. It's not whether they're native or not. It's whether they're productive. I don't care if ginkgos grew in the moon 7 million years ago, they produce zero species of caterpillars. So they're not part of the local food web. You're never going to preserve anything by planting a ginkgo. What is the best keystone plant in this part of the world? Actually in 84% of the counties of North America, it's, it's oaks. It's the genus Quercus. In the mid-Atlantic states, they support 557 species of caterpillars. Nationwide, 900 species of, of caterpillars. That's 900 species of bird food supported by this one genus of plant. There's no other uh, plant genus that comes close to that. And here's the role that keystone oaks play in our yard. Remember, I've taken pictures of, of 1,030 moss species so far. Haven't gotten to the butterflies yet, so we're just doing moss. Um, out of that 1,030 species, 906 have known host plants. Out of the 906, 267 species use oaks. Now we have 69 genera of native woody plants on our property and only one of them is, is oaks, Quercus. And we've got hundreds of genera of herbaceous plants. So oaks represent less than 1.5% of our woody plant diversity and way less than 1% of our total plant diversity yet they are supporting at least 29% of our moth species. So imagine what would happen if we took oaks out of the system. What would happen to our diversity? The diversity of the insects, the diversity of the birds that eat those insects. How are you going to know what your keystone species are? You go to Native Plant Finder on the National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code and the ranked list of uh, both woody and herbaceous plants um, ranked in terms of the, the uh, number of caterpillar species that they produce will pop up. So again, oaks are going to be number one here followed by, by native cherries and, and uh, willows. Now notice I'm saying native oaks, native cherries, native willows, native birches. If you go to the, to the nursery and say, well, I want to buy a cherry, they're going to sell you an Asian cherry. If you say, I want to buy a willow, they'll sell you a weeping willow. They'll sell you a, 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 you know, a weeping uh, birch from Europe or a, a, a Japanese maple because that's what's loaded, what our, our nurseries are loaded with. You have to specify that you want a native member of these genera because if you don't, it's going to reduce caterpillar use by 65%. These are the uh, top uh, genera of herbaceous plants. Goldenrods are always way up there. The various genera of asters, um, sunflowers. Those three genera alone are supporting more than 40 species of native bee specialists in, in New England. So if you don't plant those, uh, those genera, that's 40 species you're not going to have in, in your landscape. 
all right, we're going to cut the lawn in half. We're going to put in keystone plants uh, and attract all these insects to our yard. And then we're going to kill them with our security light. And that, of course, is not the goal. You know, research, particularly in Europe, is, is showing that light pollution uh, is one of the major causes of insect declines. Um, all of these are ways that, that lights kill insects at night by exhaustion, by collisions, incineration, dehydration, the bat comes and eats them. Bright lights blind a, a lot of nocturnal insects and it keeps them from doing what they're supposed to be doing. This looks like bad news, but I actually think it's really good news because if this is a major cause of insect decline, it is the easiest one to turn around. With a flick of a switch, just turn your lights off. But I know what you're going to say. You can't turn your lights off because the bad man will come. All right, put a motion sensor on your security light so that uh, it only turns on when the bad man does come. And the first thing you're going to you're going to find out is that the bad man doesn't come very often. Uh, if you don't want to do that, take the white light out of your security light and put in a yellow bulb. A yellow LED light is the least attractive to nocturnal insects. If we all switched out our, our um, night lights with yellow LED lights overnight in the summertime, we'd save billions of, of insects and probably billions of dollars too, because LED lights are a lot more energy efficient. All right, we're going to reduce the lawn. We're going to put in keystone plants. We're going to turn out our lights. We've got all these insects. Then we're going to invite Mosquito Joe to come and kill them all. Uh, we're doing this all over the country. This is, I mean, this is a booming industry now, um, fogging mosquitoes. Mosquito Joe will tell you, well, this is a natural product, so it's okay. It is a natural product. It's pyrethroids that come from plants, but you know, cyanide is a natural product too, um, and I wouldn't say that's okay. He might also tell you it only kills mosquitoes. That is just plain uh, not true. Um, it kills all the insects it comes in contact with. If you really want to control mosquitoes, you do it in the larval stage, not in the adult stage. You get a bucket, fill it full of water, uh, put in some straw or hay, uh, and let it ferment for a couple of days. And that becomes irresistible to mosquitoes, females. We're gonna lay their eggs, ovipositing mosquitoes. Um, once she lays her eggs, um, let the eggs hatch. Then you put in a mosquito dunk. That is Bacillus thuringiensis. It is a natural bacterium that kills aquatic diptera. Uh, and only aquatic diptera. So if you get a, a dragonfly larva in there, it's not gonna touch it. If the bird drinks from it or your dog, it's totally harmless. Uh, but it kills the mosquitoes. It's a very targeted way to control mosquitoes if everybody did this. It's also really cheap. Mosquito Joe is very expensive. Okay, fourth thing we need to do is to landscape in a way that allows caterpillars to complete their development. What do I mean by that? Well, I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania, where oaks support 511 species of, of caterpillars. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete their development on the tree. So the caterpillar eats the leaves, then it spins a cocoon and hangs from a branch, then the adult emerges and it does it all again. I wish everything did that, but most species don't. Most species drop from the tree. 480 of those species, 94% drop from the tree and they wiggle their way beneath the ground and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter that is under the tree. The problem, of course, is there is no leaf litter under the tree, and we mow it and compact the soil to the point where the caterpillars cannot get underground to pupate. So they drop out of the tree and they die, and the next generation is smaller, and the next generation after that is gone. I am convinced that our, our, um, the typical way we treat the landscape under our trees is one of the major causes of insect decline. And of course, the, the cement landscape is even uh, less of a viable option for caterpillars. Uh, I'm not trying to discourage the use of, of trees in cities. I'm trying to discourage the use of the profligate use of, of cement as a default landscape. That's just laziness and it destroys our watersheds as well. This is what most people do. You have a big tree and you, you uh, put it in the middle of the lawn. Nobody has measured uh, how well caterpillars survive in a situation like this, but I guarantee they survive better in a situation like this, where you have a tree, then a layered landscape. You can have a dogwood over here and a native azalea and ferns and ground cover. Caterpillar drops down to a safe site. It can easily get below the ground. It can spin its cocoon. It's not going to be trampled, not going to be mowed. No problem. This is where you can do your spring ephemeral gardening. This is the way you shrink the lawn. You have a tree, you build a big bed around that tree and that's a lot of area that's not in lawn anymore and you're creating another safe site for 
the caterpillars. This is where you can use your ground covers like wild ginger and may apple and foam flower and, and uh, many, many more. And of course, they're all safe sites. Ferns, great, great safe sites, particularly in New England. This is at a hotel, but look, caterpillars could survive here. They really could. Uh, another uh, grad student, Desiree Narago, has uh, done some wonderful work with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., and the results of her study suggest there is room for compromise in our plant choices, and that's good news. What she did was look at how, how well chickadee populations reproduced, how well they could be sustained in landscapes that were dominated by native plants versus landscapes dominated by non-native introduced plants. When the landscapes were dominated by non-native plants, they produced 75% fewer caterpillars. So right away, they reduced the amount of, of uh, bird food by 75%. Those landscapes were 60% less likely to have breeding chickadees at all. Now there's a nest box up in each, each landscape, but the chickadees would come and look around and they said, there's not enough food here. We're not even gonna try. If they did try, those nests contained 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to to survive, excuse me, the nest produced 1.2 fewer fledglings uh, and it took them 1.5 days longer to mature. And if you put all that together in a population growth model as a function of the percentage of non-native woody plant biomass in the landscape from none to 100%, this is what you get. The dotted line is replacement rate. This is the rate at which the population has to make babies in order to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. If you reproduce at this rate, you've got a sustainable population. It's not growing. Oops, come back here. Come back here. But it's not shrinking either. If you make more babies than adults die, you have a growing population. But if you make fewer, you've got a shrinking, unsustainable population. Right here is where those lines overlap. That's around 30% non-plant biomass which means you need about 70%, at least 70% of your, your woody plant biomass to be native, to be productive natives in order to have a sustainable breeding bird population. But it also means you can have up to 30% that is not native. You can have your crepe myrtle, you can have your boxwoods, no invasive plants because that, that's biological pollution. But uh, you can have those other plants without destroying the food web. Uh, and that's what I'm excited about here because this is, this is the zone of compromise. If my message was that you could not have any non-native plants, um, I'm really glad it's not because most people wouldn't listen. We love our non-native plants. It's not the presence of non-native plants that destroys food webs. It's the absence of native plants. So we get those native plants in there. We can still have a few of these and it'll be okay. Can we use native plants in formal landscapes? Of course we can. Got this picture from uh, someplace in North Carolina where they're adding nati native plants to this form of landscape. Here's, here's Joe Pye. Notice I didn't call it Joe Pye weed. It's not a weed. Uh, and the goal is to replace everything with, with native plants. Um, you know, formality is a function of the design. It's not a function of the plants in the design. Our native plants are used in formal landscapes in Europe all the time. And I guess it's, that's okay because they're non-native plants over there. Can we get a pollinator garden into, into a typical suburban yard like this without offending anybody? Of course we can, just put a little fence around it. Look at all the species of plants in there that could service um, specialist native bees. It's not a very big site, but if everybody did it, uh, it would satisfy the needs of a lot of, of native bees. You know, a lot of people think, we, we say, well, we need pollinators because they pollinate a third of our crops. That's not actually true. It's about, you know, 12% of our, our crops. Um, but let's not talk about crops. People think, well, if I don't live next to a farm, I don't need pollinators. That is not true. Remember, 80% of all plants and 90% of all flowering plants require pollinators. If we lost our pollinators, we'll lose 80 to 90% of the plants on the planet. Not an option. It is simply not an option. Where do we need these pollinators? Everywhere where we need plants, which is everywhere, which is our yards too. How about this? This is a much bigger site here that I drew Latham design. Uh, imagine the amount of life that is here versus the amount of life that is here. That's what we're talking about. Can municipalities help us live with nature? Of course they can. And more and more of them are doing that. Minnesota has a cost sharing program. Encourages homeowners to, to replace some or all of their lawn with appropriate Minnesota prairie plants. And, and the state helps you do that. Florida is paying people. Uh, and in a, one island in Florida is playing, paying people to allow burrowing owls to burrow in their front yard. 
Birmingham's list of species. This is the way the Endangered Species Act should have been written with carrots rather than sticks. So rather than fine you for, for doing something on your property when you've got an invasive species or an endangered species, they should pay you. You get a tax break for taking care of it. Missouri and Fayetteville, Arkansas have a, a uh, bounty on calorie pears. If you take down a cal calorie pear, you get a free tree replacement. And even, even uh, utilities are getting into the act there, giving people $100 coupons in, in uh, San Antonio to plant water efficient native species. Buffalo is giving people $100 coupons to put in natives. So it's happening in a lot of places. And then, of course, the, the uh, big uh, lawn replacement programs in California, particularly $2 per square foot rebate by getting rid of your thirsty lawn and putting in xeric plantings. I think we've made three missteps in the early years of conservation. And the first one is that, uh, you know, we like nature. We've assumed it's important, but not essential. And that's, that's the problem. Because when push comes to shove, when there's a shortage of resources, if it's not essential, nature loses. I went to the, the Cincinnati Zoo before the virus broke out and there was this wall size poster, which to me epitomizes what our society thinks about conservation. That's what Teddy Roosevelt thought about conservation. We want to save wildlife so future generations can enjoy it. Um, the problem with that I have with that is that it suggests nature's there for our entertainment. It is far more than that. We want to save nature so that we have future generations. It's a much more urgent message. We've also assumed that humans and nature cannot coexist. We talked about this, but if we restrict conservation just to places where we don't have a lot of humans, um, they're going to fail because the, those places are too small and too isolated from each other. David Quammen has this excellent analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. This is a functional Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That's 71 rug fragments, none of which are acting like a Persian rug. And this is what we've done to our ecosystems. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance. I hate that language because it suggests there's places on planet Earth that have no ecological significance. Not so. Every square inch of the planet has ecological significance, including our yards, including all of our human dominated spaces. So we have to glue our rug back together again by putting plants in these no man lands and focus on those, those uh, keystone plants. We don't want to just make, make biological carters so that plants and animals can move back and forth. We want to make habitat that is so good they can actually live there. We're going to start to share our spaces with nature. Our third misstep was to leave Earth stewardship just to a few specialists, you know, a few ecologists, a few, few uh, conservation biologists, a few tree huggers. We didn't see it as an, in, an inherent responsibility of every human being on the planet. And I don't know why, because every human being on the planet depends entirely on the quality of Earth's ecosystems. So why wouldn't every one of us bear the responsibility for good Earth stewardship? Stan Run Rushworth once said that the Western settler mindset was, I have rights. The mindset of uh, indigenous people is, I have obligations. You're not born with these mindsets, you're taught them. We've been really good at teaching this one, I have rights, but we've been terrible at teaching uh, everybody what their obligation to, to earth stewardship is. We've got to get better at that. It doesn't mean you have to save biodiversity for a living, although it is a good living, but you can save it where you live. And I like this approach because it empowers each one of us. This, you know, this is the biodiversity crisis is a global crisis, but it, but it has a grassroots solution. You as an individual can make a difference. Shrink your lawn, put in a pollinator garden, get rid of your invasive plants, use those keystone plants. One person can do all of that and recreate a functioning ecosystem right where you live. It also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't think about the entire planet's problem. That, that can get depressing. Just worry about the piece of the earth that you can influence. And if you don't own property, you can volunteer, help somebody who does, help a land conservancy, help a local park. They're all underfunded, all, all short staff. So as property owners or volunteers, each one of us has the power. And we certainly have the responsibility to fix dead landscapes like this. Whether we decide to do so is going to determine nature's fate and then ultimately our own fate. And I've convinced my grandchildren that you are nature's best hope. I hope I've convinced you as well. Thanks very much.
Thank you, Doug. That was amazing. <laughs> You're welcome. Bob, and we have so many fabulous questions here. I am so impressed. Um, are you are you ready? Uh, well, we'll try. Try me. <laughs> um, the um, first viewer um, would like to say um, she saw some mountain laurel leaves in the woods with bites taken out of them. Is the mountain laurel a uh, host plant for anything? Yes, but not very much. <laughs> um, so when we rank all of those plants, um, you know, mountain laurel is a good native plant, but uh, it's just not very high on, on the list. Almost, I mean, there are very few plants that nothing can eat. There are some, but very few. Um, so, you know, when I say we want to focus on keystone plants, we do want to focus on keystone plants, but it's like when you're building a house, you have to start with the, with the two by fours. You can't leave them out. But it doesn't mean you leave your house at two by fours. You can put in sheetrock and you can put in wallpaper to round it out. You just can't leave the keystone plants out. Got it. Great answer. Great answer. Um, another question was, are pollinators um, made of plants in New England the same as those pollinator populate? Sorry. <laughs> um, are pollinators of native plants in New England the same as those that pollinate popular exotic plants, such as many vegetables? Okay, um, pollinate, we can divide pollinators into two groups. The specialists that we talked about, the ones that can only reproduce on particular plant genera, and those are always gonna be native. Uh, and we have generalists. So things like the honeybee, uh, it's an introduced pollinator. It's a good one. Uh, and it pollinates lots of, of plants. Uh, and bumblebees are pretty good generalists too. Uh, any any uh, thing with a deep corolla can be pollinated by a, a bumblebee, and some other generalist bees. But uh, and generalist bees are good at going to a lot of different types of flowers. So a lot of people see bees on their non-native plants, and they say, "See, I'm helping all the pollinators." Well, you're helping the generalists. Sam Drogi uh, describes that as as like helping the starlings and the and the. Uh, the house sparrows uh, oh, yeah. of the bird world. So, you know, it's good. We need our generalists, but you can't leave out all the specialists either. And that's why we say plant for the specialists because the generalists will use those plants as well. Um, so this brings up another question. Um, native bees versus European honeybees. How do you feel about that? You know, we, we as Europeans, we brought the honeybee with us because they are so good at, at pollinating many of the crops that are also non-native plants that we depend on. Honeybees, they have huge hives and they have a very long foraging distance. They can fly uh, a good distance from the hive to pollinate. Whereas many of our native bees have a much shorter range when they're, they're pollinating. But remember, before the honeybee came here, the, our native uh, insects and, and birds, some birds, did all the pollinating. Um, and it, there was a lot of plants here, they did fine. Uh, so honeybees are, are very useful for, for many of our crops, but um, we can't, you know, our native, native bees would do a, a great job too if, we, if they were in better shape. So we can't say, oh, the honeybee is going to do all of it. I mean, you see what happens when we rely on the honeybee. They're declining like everything else. So we need to support both of them. And here is a little political question for you. Oh boy. Well, yeah, here we are. <laughs> what do you think of the 30% goal for land protection announced by the Biden administration? What a breath of fresh air. <laughs> um, what yeah. do I think? Yeah, well, you know what? There, we, we can look at data. If we preserve 30% of the land, by preserve, I mean we have real good functioning ecosystems. If we preserve 30% of the US, we're gonna save 30% of the US's species. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence over the long term. Uh, so obviously you say, well, I want more than that, then you gotta preserve more than that. But um, you know what, he's, what, what Biden's talking about is protecting 30% of the land. What I'm talking about is in addition to that, we're going to have functioning ecosystems outside of all of those protected areas, all the areas like your yard is not protected, but it doesn't mean it can't be a functional ecosystem. Then we get that percentage of land way up there, get up to 60, 70, 80 percent, and you've saved 80 percent of the species. That's a much better target. But 30 percent of protected land, great. I mean, right now, I think it's 14 oh, percent. So, so yeah, got a long way to go. Huge improvement. Um, Here's a kind of COVID related question. Um, 
in the avian world, people have shared that they can hear different bird song um, that they think maybe do because the pandemic and it's more quiet. Any unusual observations regarding Lepidoptera during 2020? Well, I have not traveled since March 8th. You know, it's funny, for, for years I get emails and people say, I hope you're enjoying your, your garden and your yard. I would never home, you know, I didn't even know what it looked like. <laughs> but this year, this year, I have enjoyed it. I have gotten, and we're almost to the point where I've been here for a full year and I've gotten to see the cycle of everything. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, so I, that 1,030 moss species, I added over 200 last year because I was home and I could go out looking for them all the time. Um, so that, you know, to me, it was discovering how many species we really have. I used to say, well, maybe it'll stop around a thousand, but I'm convinced I'm getting so many new ones all the time that it's going to go way higher than that. And what this says is, look at all the biodiversity you could, you can support on just a small piece of, of land. That, to me, that's very exciting. And I probably wouldn't have discovered that without COVID. <laughs> well, that's true. I think COVID actually is forcing people to stop and observe where they are, which is also works um, for, you know, wanting to bring more wildlife to your property. Yes, yes. Well, here's an interesting question. What is the oldest ecological reference book that you have in your library? <laughs> <laughs> that is one I haven't gotten before. The oldest equal. Oh, you know what? I've got uh, a an old text by Fabre, wrote about wasps and other insects. And when did he do it? In the late 1800s, I think. Wow. So I have it, but it doesn't mean I'm a scholar of it. But that would be <laughs> the oldest one. That would be the oldest one. Yeah. This is an interesting question about um, population increases. Um, and we have a culture of continual growth. How can we ever save anything while ignoring this overarching issue? Ultimately, we can't. Hmm. The earth, you know, we can grow our population at the same size, at the same rate that the earth is growing, which is not very fast. Um, the earth is finite. The resources on it are finite. And yes, technology can help us increase the carrying capacity. But you know, every time we put another human on the planet, we're taking resources away from something else. So it's a it's it's robbing Peter to pay pay Paul. We're jamming as many people as possible uh, on the planet, but um, not in a sustainable way. And that COVID is a great way of of you know talking about that, we wouldn't have any discussions about endangered species or declining this or, or uh, climate change or anything else if we weren't over the carrying capacity of the planet. So, so the, the, you know, it's our capitalistic uh, perpetual growth model that, that, you know, is supporting this. You got to have more people to buy more widgets every year. Yep. That is not sustainable, and you know I've I have had people walk out of my talks if I if I talk like this. But this is just you know this is this is physics, folks. Um, it has nothing to do with politics. It has nothing to do with economics. It's the fact that finite is, resources are finite, and if we want to stick around the planet for much longer, we're going to have to stop growing. We're going to have to find. Um, you know, service type industries where everybody's happy, but not everybody's getting richer all the time because that doesn't work. Not, not in the long run. And here's a question about your wife. Um, how She's did she um, handle getting rid of all those invasives? Did she use <laughs> or something? And it's very nice of you to congratulate her on it. <laughs> how does she do it? Uh, first of all, she likes doing it. Um, now she didn't do it overnight. Uh, she, that is what she does for entertainment. She goes out and, and pulls weeds. So in the beginning, you know, we had a lot of big bodies and, and uh, I did help in, in the beginning somewhat, but um, she won't use herbicides. Okay. So uh, that, you know, I hate to get into the herbicide thing, but she won't, she won't do it. Uh, she's got asthma and she just, you know, she's just not going to do it. But it doesn't make it easier for her, for sure. If you don't kill the rootstocks, they just keep coming back. She's happy to keep cutting them. <laughs> but, but um, you know, uh, she had to do that forever. So uh, I do 
use a little bit of herbicide. I don't spray okay. because there's always non-targets there. But what I do is I cut and then and paint. So I'm using a very little material just on the, the stump for woodies. I, we, we, we really haven't focused a lot on the herbaceous ones, things like, like uh, Japanese uh, stilt grass. That's yeah, a huge problem. What do you do with it? I don't know what you do with it, but but um, pulling it doesn't do any good. So, and spraying the world just kills everything. So I'm not going to do that either. Yeah. Controlling the woodies is comparatively easy. Uh, it's a constant headache. Yes, I agree. I agree. Um, um, here's a question about: um, Is using native cultivars better or worse than using non-native plants? Um, it depends. Let's rephrase that and say, is it as good as using, oh, you said non-native plants? Um, so yeah, is using oh, native okay. cultivars okay. better or worse than using non-native? Okay. All right. I'll say it's better. Okay. Um, now it, it still depends. So for example, if, if I want to help pollinators and I like blood root and I buy the double blood root, Mm -hmm. Double plant has taken the reproductive parts of the flower and turned them into petals. And it's big and showy and beautiful and services no pollinators because there's no nectar and there's no, no pollen. Native plant. So if I had a, a non-native plant that did make pollen and nectar, I would at least be servicing the generalists. Um, so, you know, in that compare, it depends on what it is, but, the, but most generally speaking, if your choice is between a plant from Asia and a native cultivar, I would get the cultivar okay. because the chances that that will be a more productive plant are much greater. Good. And here's a question about public education. Um, is anyone measuring whether public education on pollinators has been working um, to stem the de decline? Do we have any information on that? I you know, somebody might. The entire country has been exposed to the needs of pollinators for several years now. Um, and it's very popular. So I would say, you know, I haven't measured it, but I would say, yes, the public is much more aware of it. You know, the whole save the monarch thing oh, and, yeah. the, and, the, and the colony collapse disorder for honeybees. We've been hearing about this for, for you know, over a decade. So I, th I think awareness, I'm sure awareness is much higher at this point. And look at all the pollinator pathways. People are into it all over the place. So much so that they think that's the only problem is pollinators. Nobody's talking about my caterpillars. You know? <laughs> I don't think people equate butterflies and moths with caterpillars. That's just not, it's a disconnect, I think. <laughs> it's true. That's true. But um, we have more than one problem. We do want to save our pollinators, but we got to save the food web as, as well. Um, um, here's an interesting question. Um, what is your opinion about the business that raises insects to feed humans? Could that be one way to reduce the cattle raised on our grasslands? Well, it, it could be. Um, insect protein, you know, the, there's some studies have shown that there's twice as much protein pound for pound in insect meat as there is in beef. So oh. if you're just making protein, you know, grams of protein from, from grasshopper powder or something, uh, that could work. Of course, those grasshoppers have to eat something, but the, the conversion of energy into protein is much more efficient with insects than it would be for, for cattle. What's really going to reduce the number of cows on on the rangeland in my opinion are these you know these the the impossible burger or the um beyond beef beyond beef yeah yeah i've had those they're, they're good and it's you know you're you're eating a, a cow tasting soybean but um you can that uses 90 percent less water 90 percent, 95 percent less land that's the way to go and yeah. it tastes good yeah, yeah, and yeah, I put it in a lasagna or exactly you know, right. You can't even tell. <laughs> um, here's a question about viburnum. Um, we have had problems up here with caterpillars, like completely stripping bare viburnum bushes, and I think this is not a native um, uh, beetle that is doing this. Um, uh, the, this um, viewer was very upset and she sprayed the bushes and she wonders if she should have rejoiced because she was creating caterpillar foods for birds 
or, or let him be. Um, and you know, what's gonna happen to her viburnum? Okay, she's talking about the viburnum leaf beetle. It, it is, is not yeah. a caterpillar at all. Ah. It is a beetle and it is an introduced species. So it's just like the gypsy moth or the emerald ash borer. When I say we need insects, we I am not talking about non-native insects because they are here. It's not their fault. We brought them here, but they're here without any of their natural enemies. And that always results in huge problems like the defoliation of your, your viburnum. So do not be sad about killing the viburnum leaf beetle. Um, it is a big problem for particularly for viburnum dentatum arrowwood. Yeah. Um, there is some evidence that uh, some of these invasive species, you know, they, they come into the country, they go crazy, and then they start to decline. That's true for the brown marmorated stink bug and some others. Nobody really knows why, but, and the viburnum leaf beetle is looking a little bit like that as well. I've got them at my house, um, but each year they're fewer and fewer. Of course, I do go around and squish them, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but don't you know that we're, I, we don't want invasive insects. They just cause huge amounts of problems. Um, and that's a good segue into the winter, winter moth problem, which we also have up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, some arborists um, um, apply Sinosad or BT to control um, the winter mm -hmm. moth. Is that also toxic to other caterpillars on? Mm -hmm. Yep, kills all the caterpillars. Oh, okay. So the winter moth is, is an interesting situation. Another one we brought from Europe. Mm -hmm. There's two, two reasons why I suggest you do not spray winter moth mm -hmm. at this point. One is um, it's, a, it's an inchworm. It's a geometrid moth with no physical defenses, which means our birds like to eat them. Wow. And it comes out exactly when the migrants are moving through. Of course, the problem is we don't have nearly enough migrants anymore, but when they move through, it's a, it's a great source of food for those poor migrating birds. If you spray them, you've just wiped out not only the winter moth, but all the other caterpillars that the migrants need. That's one reason. The other reason is they're introducing um, little wasps, little parasitic wasps that control them. And that is working really well. I talked to the guy at the University of Massachusetts who's working on this. He says he's having trouble finding populations to even work on now because they're declining so much. If you spray, you kill the parasitoid too. So uh, it's at this point, it is better to let that parasitoid uh, exert some control. Your trees can take a lot more um, damage, yeah. really not defoliation, but damage than people think. They think if there's any insect on there, you got to kill them all right away. But that, then you get stuck in the, the pesticide syndrome where you've knocked out the natural enemies too. And then the pest really does cause a problem. So you have to spray again and around and around you go. Um, I, I think uh, people just need to get more comfortable with kind of bugs in general. They're, you know. They do, they do. <laughs> um, now we have one more, well, I guess ticks aren't really bugs, but um, tick question. Um, so, you know, we have Lyme's disease up here. I know you probably have it down there too. Um, do non-toxic repellents like essential oils, like wintergreen, clove oil, or even garlic, do they work to control ticks? Are they harmful to pollinators? I know their garlic might be harmful to, you know, vampires, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, that's not my area of research. I don't, uh, if I, I, I doubt if they would ever kill them, but they may, they may repel them, but I'm not, I'm not sure. Ticks, ticks like uh, moist vegetation. So, so drought controls them. They, their numbers drop if, if you have a serious drought. Of course, we haven't had a drought up here. In, in, well, you, act, you actually do have some droughts up there, but we've had crazy rain down here. Um, we had a little drought here um, last summer, but we've the, had a lot of rain um, this winter so far. Good, good. Uh, but ticks um, crawl up on vegetation and quest. They sit there and they put their little legs out. And when you walk by, they grab onto you and that's how they get on you. They're not walking across your yard looking for you. They're waiting for you to go where they are. So when, when I say leave half the, the lawn, 
make them broad swaths of grass so you can easily walk around your yard without touching the vegetation on the side and that's the easiest way to avoid the ticks also be be more sensitive to the danger times in the season may and june are the two months that you're most likely to get infected um, so that's the time to be most vigilant to check check you know after you've been out um, you know, I've had, I've had Lyme disease five times, so I'm, I'm talking from experience here. I would never, and this is my opinion, I would never sacrifice my time in the natural world because I might get Lyme disease. I'll, t I'll tell you something that I'm not telling you because I'm not a medical doctor. So you're not hearing this from me. Okay, I'm not listening. <laughs> Go ahead. But a guy who, who, who uh, from Penn University of Pennsylvania who works on Lyme disease told us this years ago. It takes many hours. Let's say a deer tick or black legged tick is, is uh, actually attached to you and is sucking on your blood. It takes many hours for the Borrelia to transfer from the tick's body into your capillaries. So if you pull the tick off and put Neosporin on that spot, maybe a couple times um, within the first 12, 15 hours, you kill the Borrelia before it gets into your, your capillaries. Uh, and all I can say is, I haven't had Lyme disease since we started doing that, except for a time I, I, I had itchy toes and I thought it was athlete's foot. So I didn't even look. It was a tick between my toes and I didn't put the Neosporin on and I got Lyme disease. <laughs> but when I, you know, when I did what he said, now, fortunately, both Cindy and I itch when we get a tick. So we know, oh, we got to check this spot. It's easy. If you don't itch and you don't get the bullseye, it is much more of a challenge. I, I recognize that. But for us, it's it's relatively easy that and that neosporin is so easy. You don't have to get a test or anything. Do I have it? Just put neosporin on it right away. Now, if you let it go two or three days, too late. Good advice. I am going to remember that because I am okay. on my yard a lot too. Um, yeah, yeah. So here's a question. Um, how far away can the reservoir of Lepidoptera species be um, to potentially restock an area? Yeah, well, it's one of the reasons I was telling you those stories uh, early on. So the, you know, the, the zebra swallowtail, I think it went 26 miles, took it nine years to do it. But um, oh. and of course, you know, there, there's several leps that actually uh, migrate. You know, the monarch goes thousands of miles and it's laying eggs the whole time. So they, they can find milkweed patches uh, right away. Uh, but it, it's going to depend. I actually have a grad student who's starting this year. Uh, and that's one of the questions that he's going to start researching. How far can some of our tiny moths actually move to colon, colonize? The question is, you know, I'm telling people, put these plants in your yard, but can the insects find them? Yeah. And we're going we're gonna to measure that. Um, it's looking like, though, here's my prediction. They're really good at doing that. Okay. Um, now, it could be that only the generalists find them, the specialists don't. This is what we're going to find out, but they're never going to find it if we don't put the plants in there. So true. So true. Um, this um, viewer has um, a lot of shade in her uh, yard. And what plants um, can she plant in order to attract insects? Okay, I'm going to show you a book here. Okay. It's, it's under my computer, so I have to pull it out. Um, before I do that, you know, I, I, your spring ephemerals all do well in shade because they come out before the leaves even come out. And they're good at very early season, uh, providing pollen and nectar for very early season bees. Things like hydrangea arborescens is our native hydrangea. Straight species, don't get Annabelle, that's a, a, a sterile cultivar. Um, that blooms pretty well in the shade. It doesn't need a lot of, lot of sun. It's excellent for pollinators. Uh, but this book here, Essential Native Trees and Shrubs of the Eastern U.S., uh, by Tony Dove and Ginger Woolridge. It, it starts out, it's got endless charts for mm -hmm. all of the groups of plants that tell you everything they do. Um, so I've never seen anything's better in terms of, of um, helping you zero in. You say, I want a plant that does well in the shade and it's good for pollinators and it does this and it's good in that. It's all right here. 
Uh, and I'm giving you this because we've got we've got similar charts in the back of the living landscape, but these are much better. <laughs> so, so get that book and and it will answer your all of your needs. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, here's a question. Okay, about there's a there's a thing there. Too fast. What's the book? It's Essential Native Trees and Shrubs for the Eastern United States. Um, Here's a question about honey locusts. Um, though it's not native to New England, does it support a lot of native insect species? Yes, it does, uh, because it's been planted uh, in connection to the areas where it is native. So in other words, the things that use honey locusts, and it's true for black locusts too, followed it as we planted it from the Midwest up into New England and wherever we're using it now. Um, so, you know, the, the pipe vine swallowtail is only on pipe vine in the Appalachian Mountains, except now we sell pipe vine as an ornamental uh, native pipe vine, and people are planting it all the way to Virginia Beach, and the butterfly has followed it right, right down to the oceans, out of the mountains. It just needs its host plant. Wow. Uh, so, you know, is that a natural thing? Well, insects are good at following their needs. We keep moving what they need and they're following it. I'd much rather have it that way than to, to move pipe vine and have the butterfly not follow it. So um, at this point, those populations have expanded and there you have it. Cool. cool. Um, here's a question about um, streetlights. Um, what do you do if you have a street light right in front of your house? And how do you reduce that? That's uh, I think I mentioned that a lot of this research is coming from Europe. Well, Europe has been much more responsive in terms of what to do about it. Mm. So the technology for, for having street lights that are not attractive is much farther along there. They're taking it seriously. You know, our municipalities aren't thinking about that at all. Oh, we're not even gonna think about that, but we could. We could, we find out what the Europeans are doing and get their light bulbs over here. And, and uh, it's really pretty easy. It just takes, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of money and some effort, but I think we have made progress that a lot of the street lights are not nearly as attractive as they used to be already. Either that or the insects are all gone because I never see anything flying around up there. Yeah, so. I, I was wondering the same because um, yes. I just am very excited when mine go out because I, I I just don't particularly like them and I don't call the town and have them come replace them. So. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> <Anyway>. will. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, I have a couple of questions about oaks and um, it's like, does it matter if it's a white oak, a red oak or black oak? Oaks uh, in this part of the country are divided into two groups, the red oak group and the white oak group. Mm -hmm. um, I do have, I have another student comparing uh, 15 species of oaks in terms of insect use. And so they will fall very nicely into those two groups. And I will be able to answer that question definitively probably within the next month. Uh, I think the white oak group is gonna edge out the okay. red oak group but not by much. So at this point, I wouldn't worry about it. I would make sure it's a native oak. Don't plant the Chinese oak uh, because I know that doesn't support as much, but um, get, get an oak that's appropriate for where you are. Not all oaks belong everywhere. So plant the ones that belong where you are. And uh, the one thing you might wanna think about are the diseases that we brought in for oaks. So right now, uh, right where I live, we've got oak leaf scorch, which is, hits the red oak group much more. It doesn't hit the white oak group at all. But if we go a little farther west, then there's there's oak wilt, which I think only hits the, the white oak group. So it depends on where you are, but you wanna dodge the disease that's doing the most damage where you are. Um, if I, so when I plant something, I don't know, I plant both, both groups here, but um, I do favor the white oak group. It's it, what wants to be here and the red oaks are suffering, so. All right. Um, it's so complicated, it seems. Yeah. Um, but plant something. I think that's a, a good way to be. Don't, you know, an arbor says don't, don't plant an oak at all because this and this and this is going to happen. Don't do that. Even if it dies in 20 years, so what? If you've had 20 good years, they plan another one and they, because those young oaks are productive. Yeah. Um, here's a, a question I think about um, 
your website, um, they put in our zip code and it lists um, zero results. Um, oh, is this a, which is, is this a Boston zip code? Um, yeah, so it's 02421, it's a Lexington Mass zip code. Um, and I've actually used it before and I have gotten results, so I'm not sure. Um, there are some holes. Okay. That, that happened in St. Louis too, because something about the zip codes. Uh, it's the it's the um, it's the way the website was built around the USDA plant database, and there are holes in the USDA plant database. Uh -huh. So, for example, in the state of Maryland, we've got several holes. It says the, there are no black cherries and there are no oaks. Not true, uh, but but that's because of holes in the in the database. We know about that. We're trying to fix all of it. Actually, the entire website's going to have a huge um, overhaul very soon where it's not gonna be based on zip code, it's gonna be based on bioregion. So rather than have 30 zillion zip codes out yeah. there, you just have to know what bioregion you're in. We'll have a nice little map up there. So for Massachusetts, I think there's maybe two or maybe three bioregions, that's it. You're in that bioregion, here are the plants that are best in that, that bioregion. It's gonna be much simpler, much easier to use. Yeah, that that, that will be so good. so if it's not working where you are just pick a, a one nearby you know the, the plants don't change that much well and i think we have two zip codes so just use the 02420 zip code okay. i think that would probably work um good. here is um a question about um plants for um wetland area are there some native plants that you consider to be good for a wetland area yes many 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 um, let's start with the, the woody plants. In general, woodies are supporting more than the herbaceous plants, but that's general. But, you know, Ilex verticillata, uh, winterberry, um, clethra, almifolia, mm -hmm. the sweet pepper bush, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, button bush. Um, I think you have it up. Yes, we do. Yeah. Yeah. They can all grow, well, I just named can grow in standing water. So talk about wetlands, I mean, and they're great pollinator plants uh, for wetlands. If you look at our ranked list of keystone plants, number two or number three in most places are willows, native willows, super plants. They're super for early season pollinators and they're super for caterpillars, they do both. Um, so you definitely wanna get your willows in, in, in the wetland areas. Uh, and then there's countless herbaceous plants that are, that are great as well. That Biden's Aristosa I talked about, uh, that likes uh, wet areas, so. Cool. Georgia, um, this is Christine. I'm sorry to cut in. I'm keeping an eye on the time and it's 10 of nine. Oh so my goodness. I, there's no way we're gonna hit all the questions and I apologize to everyone. There's so much interest. But and there's so many fabulous questions. There are. And so I have actually copied all of the questions into a Google Doc so that we can sit down and look at them later and see if we can address them in another program or some other format. So I have captured that. But I think um, out of respect for Doug's time and selfishly to give me time to process this recording and put it online because we've had multiple <laughs> requests for that, I think this needs to be our last question, please. Thank you. Okay, so goodness, a last question. Um, let me the see. pressure to choose. I know. One. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's one. Um, do neonics in the standard grub treatments for suburban lawns and treated plants and seeds by plant growers impact caterpillar populations? Um, well, in general, yes. I mean, it's it's toxic. Um, it is expressed in, you know, this, the seed coats that last a long time. You know, the research on neonics is not, is, it's not a pretty picture. <laughs> more and more it's showing that it's causing a lot of problems. I don't know why you'd ever use it for grubs in the lawn. I mean, the grubs in the lawn uh, are, are uh, those are scarab beetles, you know, it's, it's uh, June beetles. It's also Japanese beetle, but uh, it's, it's, remember, you're going to have less lawn. That'll, that'll reduce the number of Japanese beetles. You just, you just don't, it's a product that is sold because they tell you you need it, but you don't. You know, I, the last time I saw grub damage that you'd actually could identify that was back in the 50s, I think. So 
Um, that's one way, but you know, the, the seed coatings are, are, are there and they, it, it, it lasts a long time. So. So, well, thank you so much for your time. This was fabulous and obviously has a lot of interest and, um, we will take a look at your questions and figure out, um, how to get back to you on those. Um, also please check out our website, um, cause we'll have, um, several suggestions on things that you can do, well, maybe not right now because there's snow on the ground, but in the spring to make part of our your lawn a national park. All right, well, thanks a lot. I would like to say my thanks from the library to, to Georgia and Sarah for bringing this program to us and um, to Doug for all of the time that you've given us and the attention you've given to these questions. There have been a lot of compliments in chat. Some people have said, one person said it was the best presentation they've been to in a long time. And somebody else said they wished they had the hand clapping emoji so that they could show their appreciation to you that way. So this was fabulous. I do apologize to everyone who did not get their question answered. There were more than 70 questions. So <laughs> we were not being very exclusive in the questions. There was just a big pool. I did copy those questions so we can look at another way of addressing them. Um, I think Lexington Living Landscapes has a lot of opportunity in front of them and the library would be so happy to work with you for future programs. So we will do that. And as I said at the beginning, um, I did record this and tonight or tomorrow, I will send you a link to the recording so you can go back. I wanna look at all the photographs again, personally, there was some amazing photography in there. Um, so you'll all have an opportunity to relive the night. <laughs> Sarah, do you have any final words? Um, just thanks to both you, Christine. I look forward to seeing the list of questions and um, and we can certainly get back to people some too. And thank you so much, Doug. This was a great, um, very inspirational talk. You're welcome. You're welcome. Truly a rock star in landscaping. <laughs> thank you all, all right, so much. With, for with that, I'm going to sign off. <laughs> <laughs> Good final words. Yeah, yeah, Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you.